Because I won't remember and I'll just blindly go through the whole thing without hitting the button to record. Again, we're here to talk about website audit and archive guidance. What is it? Why is it important? And before I go any further, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I'll try to do my best to project, but if you ever can't, or if you even just want to pop up and ask something, um, I am very informal, so feel free to raise your hand. My name is Kelly O'Haver. I'm a digital communication specialist with the National Institute on Aging. I've been with the National Institute on Aging for between a year and a half and two years. I'm approaching two years now. Uh, I'm NIA's web lead, so I manage and oversee a number of websites at NIA. Um, I also oversee Page Freezer, which is technically called an archiving tool, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. Prior to that, I spent 14 years in local government in Colorado, um, and my primary responsibility was management and oversight of a website and two subsites. So, enough about me. Let's move on and talk about what we're really here to talk about and what's important. Web content audit and archive guidance. So I went ahead and just as a refresher for anyone who might have forgotten, put some agenda topics back up. We're going to hit the high level at the beginning of what it, what it is, why it's important. Um, I'm also going to go into a little bit of background on NIA's web content audit and archive guidance. I always have to slow down. That's like a tongue twister for me to get through that whole statement. Then um, establishing what's in and out of scope as you're developing a guidance document. And content types, and I lump content types and the archiving schedule together. For me and our guidance document, those two really went together. So I did lump them together intentionally. Gaining stakeholder buy-in is another piece we're gonna talk about a little bit. And developing a content inventory. Um, they asked, so I went ahead and put up, if you wanna do any social media, there's the hashtags. It's up to you. So what is it? Web content. Audit and archive guidance basically is just a document that's going to establish a process for systematically reviewing or helping you for reviewing, ideally, and by, or, you know, archiving as well. You don't want to just review it. You also want to look at what you need to archive. Um, and it's going to be for all the content on your site. Now, I do put a caveat up there you may want to choose whether or not you want to omit certain things from your guidance document. And I'm gonna get into some specifics about that as we get going, but just a little teaser that it's really around thinking about like, is this already covered in another policy, for example? Why it's important. Um, I'm a big one on analogies, so you're gonna see analogies and comparative descriptions all the way through. It's just one of my quirks. But I like to regularly clean out my closets at home and I also go in annually for like a screening check. I'm high risk for cancer for a number of reasons. So there's a lot of things that I already do to just kind of do those checks annually. Just like spring cleaning, just like an annual health check is gonna help you to decide what's no longer necessary or what could potentially be an issue before it becomes an issue, it's just as important to do a web check and to try to identify those things up front. A few more reasons why it's important, kind of getting a little bit more into the meat of it. It helps with policies and regulations. It gives you kind of a structured plan and a structured process for how you can manage the web content. Um, if you're like me, I'm looking at thousands of pages and those are changing all the time. And I have multiple web editors that are going in and, and creating content. It's really hard to make sure and follow all of those. And then you're looking at you know, this policy guidance that we're responsible for maintaining. It gives you a process to connect those two. It helps identify opportunities. Um, it helps you to discover opportunities for things like ways that you might be able to improve SEO later on, um, ways that you might be able to improve user experience, naviga navigability of your site or of your pages as you're going through and reviewing them and auditing them. And this is me, and I will openly admit that I probably geek out on this way more than anybody else does, but it feels good. I think it feels good to identify issues ahead of time. I don't wanna wait for that stuff to come up later. Um, it needs to get done anyway, and I would prefer to do it now than wait later and have somebody bring it to my attention, especially if it's leadership or somebody like that that I don't want to be coming at me with a problem. 
I want to try to identify it before it gets to that place. It's also like a blueprint. So the actual audit and archive document or guidance that you set up becomes that blueprint for how you're going to do everything, how you're going to conduct your audit process of your web content. And moving on into the background for NIA. And before I go too far, again, I told you I'd come back to PageFreezer. And some of you caught me saying how PageFreezer is considered an archiving tool. So I wanted to circle around because I'm guessing that at least one person in the room probably wondered why PageFreezer wouldn't be enough if I said it's an archiving tool. And I'm going to give you my opinion. And everybody's got different opinions here. And people use PageFreezer differently and have different opinions on its full use. In my opinion, Page Freezer isn't enough. It does a great job of automatically scanning my URLs. It does a great job of scanning them on a recurring, regular time period. But it's really more of a screen capture and retrieval tool for me. It's a, it's a safety net. If I have somebody that comes back to me and says, I want to know what I did on that particular set of pages six months ago, Page Freezer is my friend. Right? I can go right back in and I can retrieve that information and I have that safety net even if we've made changes. What it's not is it's really not designed to conduct your actual audit and your actual archiving. That's something you need to do, right? So that's where I say it's called an archiving tool, but to me, you really need to have your own guidance in place and you need to be able to have your own eyes on it. Um, it's also not free. So the cost increases with Page Freezer, the number of things that you add. We're only even using it for URLs. Uh, a lot of people will end up having it go through and scan and capture like videos and all sorts of other things too. But everything you add, it's, it's a cost per. So to me, that's one more reason why you really need to have your audit and your archive plan in place because you want to be able to manage that. The more you grow, the more expensive it's going to be basically with a tool like that. So a little bit about why NIA created uh, audit archive guidance. Just like everybody else, but I'm going to say it because it's true. NIA strives to provide accurate and relevant content, and really we're trying very hard to make sure that it's accessible to everyone. To be successful and accomplish this the way we needed to, we really needed a plan in place to help us with reviewing and identifying all of that outdated content or reviewing where we maybe had content gaps or any of those types of things in order to meet that overarching need. The audit archive guidance helps us with developing and maintaining timely and accurate web content. This is my favorite one because it's not something I don't think most people would think about first when they're thinking about it. Building public trust, and I specifically put in, in quotes here, content that is authoritative and easy to understand, because that came directly from the IDEA Act guidance. And I think that's really important to keep that in mind, that you're developing this audit and archive guidance, but it's helping you to accomplish other federal regulations that we have to meet. Um, and then, again, staying in alignment with just federal requirements, policies, and regulations. Diving a little deeper on requirements, policies, and regulations, I'll share a couple of them that NIA considered as we were developing it. Uh, <clears throat> one was a web, web records guidance. Um, we looked specifically at NIHs. I can share my slides with anyone afterwards if you want. I do have links on here. That one in particular you may not be able to access without NIH VPN access. I'm not positive. Um, the HHS uh, website content lifecycle management Archive guidance, that's another mouthful. That one is publicly available for anyone, and it, it is actually a very good um, resource. Um, and then a number of different user experience and accessibility type of requirements that are out there that you probably are all already familiar with. 21st Century IDEA Act, um, USWDS, as well as Section 508.gov. Um, NIAs plan obviously is done. We're using it. We've been using it for about a year now. I am more than happy to share it with anyone. We don't have it posted anywhere publicly, but I do have my email address here, and then I'm also on the speaker bios for the event. So if you are interested in looking at ours or using it as a um, resource, let me know. Just send me an email. 
a little bit about why, a little more about why we um, developed the guidance. So before we developed this guidance, we were really in a situation where content archiving for web content was really kind of ad hoc. It was a little hit and miss. And the process and the timeline were really inconsistent across different content types, locations, various websites. Um, and this inconsistency really could kind of open you up with a, to a few problems potentially. Um, one is the perception of favoritism. We started to notice, especially with certain groups, we'd have web authors that were really active in certain areas and other areas they weren't as active. And web authors that were really active were constantly keeping their content fresh, but then other areas, maybe those pages hadn't been changed for some of them a few years. Kind of embarrassing to say, but it happens, right? When you have thousands of pages and multiple web authors, it happens. Um, another piece would be user experience cha challenges. If you don't have something in place and there's a page that hasn't been touched in a while, you might develop broken links. It just happens to all of us. Um, missing your inaccurate details, things change, right? Especially government, there's constantly new policies, new research. New, for us, it's new research. The science is always changing. You gotta make sure that those details are up to date. So specific goals that we had, we wanted to establish a standard archiving schedule that covered all major content areas. And then we wanted to leverage our policy and our archiving schedule to help ensure compliance with federal policies and regulations, to mitigate risks associated with non-compliant NIA sites, to continuously improve navigation and findability of the content, uh, refresh content, making sure it's accurate and up to date, make informed content decisions, and this is really one that's more forward thinking, to make sure that we're able to make informed decisions for what we develop, what we update, what we you know, maybe remove, what we maybe combine, uh, and safeguard the reputation of both NIA and NIH, which is again one that you might not think, but we feel that's really important as part of the role of this guiding document. So here's the part of the meat of what we really want to talk about, right? Getting into discussing what's in scope or what's out of scope and why it matters. Um, properly defining the scope of your audit and your archive, um, your, your guidance and your process, it sets those clear expectations. It helps to set kind of the guardrails. When we were doing this NIA scope we decided to specifically identify what the website guidance applies to, the websites and web applications that it doesn't apply to, as well as other digital resources that it doesn't apply to. And establishing these up front are going to really make it easier on the back end when you start to do a structured content audit. So a little bit more when you're thinking about like what's in scope, right? If you're getting to the point where you're to develop your own, you really can start thinking about some helpful resources that are already out there that you want to review. Things like other federal um, government audit and archive policies, I've already mentioned a couple. And you start thinking about what's included in theirs? Is anything excluded from theirs? Can you model your guidance off of an existing policy and maybe just tweak it a little bit to fit your needs? Why reinvent the wheel? Why make it harder if you don't have to, right? Maybe you can start from what somebody else has and just do some modifications and hit the ground running a lot faster. It's also easier, I think, for buy-in because you're, you're modeling after somebody else who already has something, right? Um, some federal policies that you might want to consider looking at, things like IDEA Act, you know, records guidance, those kinds of things. And think about how does it apply to web content? Um, is the retention of something already specifically covered somewhere else? So when you're thinking about what's out of scope, I, equally as important, <clears throat> seems kind of strange, but it is. Um, NIA really put some thought to this, and we had some internal discussions, and we chose internal collaboration sites, the ones that are you know your department share por um, SharePoint portals, your Teams channels. Those aren't in our scope. We specifically say nope, they're not. They're internal. They're not broadly accessible to the public. They don't apply. Documents in HTML, um, or documents versus HTML. Um, documents, we, we omit them. They're already covered under 
records management plan for documents anyway. There's very specific, very structured guidance for NIH for all of the institutes around documents and PDFs. So we're not going to go into that area. Why would we overlap something that's already being handled elsewhere? Right? We can look at it when we hit the page, and we can maybe advise our content um, editors or points of contact, hey, have you looked at this document in a while? But we're not going to specifically get into that because it's already covered somewhere else, and it's mandated that the content owners take care of that according to that policy. Embedded videos. This was another one that we put some thought to, but we're like, it's already stored somewhere else, it's on YouTube, and it's covered by a social media records plan. We're not going to we're not going to include it. We're going to deliberately exclude that from the piece that we're covering in our guidance. Knowledge and data sharing applications. Um, we have a lot of these that are designed for hosting scientific data indefinitely. And by the very nature of hosting it indefinitely as a resource that they can always go back to and see even the changes in the science, it, it's not going to be covered by our, our document. The other one that came up for us was grantee developed websites and web applications. Those are just kind of outside the scope. It's not something that's really, we're, we're providing some funding through a grant, but otherwise it's very hands off. It's not ours. So we specifically listed that as not covered. Yeah. So you said that I can kind of interrupt. You know, one of the, one of the challenge I think is the embedded videos. Yes. So that was like, you know, sometimes we have videos talk about reason, policy, Five years ago, then it becomes not the reason, right? And then the the worst the worst of it is um, when it changed. So it's so hard to audit, and even this transcript you can only do search, and they're like an hour video. You know, I was I was. Those are the really hard ones. Video is very challenging. We had some debates when we got to that piece around that one, and ultimately it, it fell into two buckets that would caused us to put it into the omit part. It's not actually hosted on our website. We're hosting on YouTube for our videos. That's a very good. That's a very so that that was part. Way to look at it. Yeah. yeah, and then the other piece really was it is actually covered under our social media policy, which is an existing policy. And again, why overlap something that already exists? You're basically duplicating your work if you're doing that, right? Instead, we specifically mention and list in our document these things are covered under another policy. So regarding documents versus HTML, I assume that NIA has like a lot of research reports and things like that that might be in like PDF format versus HTML, and maybe they're like 10, 15 years old. So do you sort of refer back and say, well, the records management policy says seven years, so we're recommending we take down this page, or how do you just, you just leave it there? I don't specifically tell them what to do with their documents because the other policy, right, tells them what they're supposed to be doing with their policies. And I'm <laughs> assuming that they are looking at their policy guidance for that piece. It's a tough area. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but um, dealing with really technical folks, that can be really challenging as well. Um, sometimes we run up against, depending on what it is, if it's an entire page that has something that's out there, and we're looking at trying to archive the page according to the page guidance, then we might try to nudge them with that piece. Okay. Content types and archive schedule. Remember I told you I lumped those two together on purpose. Um, content types, um, you may really want to get into thinking about your specific content types and grouping them because they're going to help you with your, what I call web checks. You're on it, right? Um, just like puzzle pieces will come together in order to create the entire puzzle, these different content types, these groups of content types will come together to paint the whole picture of your website. So, I'm here for Drupal. Shh, don't tell anybody that some of these things are gonna come up on this slide. Well, it's easy to start with Drupal, and you can start with Drupal content types. Remember that those may not be the most meaningful to every stakeholder. And really what we found is that when we started to think through how to develop those and how we were going to interact with our stakeholders, it's a collaborative project. I'm not going to ever be able to push all of those things and archive them just because I say I want to archive them, right? I'm not even going to be able to say, hey, my archive schedule recommends this. I'm going to have that discussion with them and tell them what it is, and we're going to have a back and forth dialogue. So if 
if I don't have my content types set up well to help facilitate some of that discussion, I'm already kind of missing the mark. And they, they're not all in Drupal, even if they're a web editor. They, they just don't have the same lens. So it's, it can be a starting point, but you may want to also just kind of take your Drupal hat off for a minute when you're thinking about it. And think about things like, um, how can I make it user friendly? How can I make it easy for those stakeholders as they are trying to work with me on this or when I'm trying to work with them on it and get buy-in, right? Um, and think about your user or your audience. Maybe that's a piece as well because that that's another group that you have to consider and a lot of times tying it to your user or your audience is automatically going to help make sense to your stakeholders that you're doing reviews with as well. Um, Wow, that last bullet point really got off. Sorry about that. But um, think about the content groups and then how that might affect your audit process too. Do you have a content group that is really, really large? That might mean that when you get to that piece and you're working on that content group in your audit, you're going to spend a lot more time on it. You may want to consider if there's a reason to maybe subdivide that. Just something to think about. Building an archive schedule. Um, again, I'm going to reiterate because I think this is important. I don't like to reinvent the wheel. I like to do things as easy as I can when I can. Revisit other government audit and archive policies and carefully review their uh, archive schedule. Um, when you're looking at them, consider things like do you have any similar content types? Um, can you adopt some, most? Maybe all of their timeline? I don't know. Depends on how similar you, you are to theirs. Uh, look at how they structure their recommendations within their archive schedule. And then this one's, I think, also important. Um, is there anything that you can add and elaborate on that might help with your stakeholders? Your, yes. Was there um, any specific federal agency or government agency that you felt was really helpful when creating your audit? HHS, okay. Department of Health and Human Services, yes. And theirs is publicly available. If you just, I think you could actually even just do a Google search, um, HHS archive schedule, and it's going to pop right up for you. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about NIA's archive schedule. Um, as I just pointed out, and you were very timely in asking that question, we did base ours off of HHS's existing archive schedule. What we did, though, is we took that and then we tweaked and modified it to be a better fit for our needs, for our um, organizational needs, as well as our stakeholders and our content that we had. We modified it by updating the content types we expanded some of our descriptions a bit just to further clarify expectations when we started getting into doing our audits and, and understanding what we were looking at. We added hyperlinks to examples of content types, realizing that even though I put out a content type, if I'm going to be sharing this with somebody else who isn't living in that world, especially if I'm sharing it with a point of contact who is very instrumental in reviewing the content, but they don't do anything in web at all. Examples helps with in those instances. Um, and then we defined recommendations for both audit and archive timelines. Um, the HHS plan had them lumped together as one group. Audit and archive was in one column, if you will. We def uh, divided those out. So I, I'm, this is very tiny, but as I said, if any of you want to look at ours in more detail, I just wanted to give you kind of a snapshot to give you an idea. So we've identified our content type that we give the, the link specifically as a reference point. We define our audit review recommendations. So that's how frequently we want to get in and do that web check, right? And we give some specific things on each one of our audit review recommendations. They're going to be different for each content type for us. Some of them it's something where we want to review annually. There's other ones where we'll put in and we'll say that we, you know, it's already on a review schedule or review when the scientific guidance changes, right? And then in the far column, we have a timeline for archiving. And this is also a recommendation. Um, but we try to be really, really clear about what we are hoping to get out of it. 
and I say hoping because it doesn't always work when you're working with technical people, but having something to reference back to you has a better place to be standing in to have that conversation and you're more likely to get some cooperation and get move the needle, get further if you have something. It's also, this part is really high value. The, the content types and the archive schedule I found to be the most high value piece when we were developing all of the guidance and then when we were starting to gain stakeholder buy-in to get started, as well as when we actually started implementing and conducting our content audits. Stakeholders, they cared a lot more about the content types and the archive schedule than they did about any of the rest of it, in all honesty. We kept our guidance pretty simple, but they just they glossed right over it. This was the part that they had questions for me about. So I can't stress enough, take your time. Um, I would strongly encourage you guys to consider finding other teammates when you're developing it to sit down and prepare and really kind of talk through it in collaboration and talk through, does that seem like the right timeline? Does that seem like the right content grouping? You know, how might that go over when we go to interact with this stakeholder? Um, research how other governments handle it. How do they break up those content types? Um, look at things that are out there for, and this was us, I don't know if it's gonna be everybody, but I'm gonna give it as a suggestion, but are there other governments out there that are managing content types that have kind of a, a review by date or like have a, a, you know, the amount of dates that they have it out there? For things like advisory group mater um, materials or events or workshops, this is something that I've we found is kind of like a stumbling block. They wanna keep it out there forever. It's the scientific community and they always think that there's a reason to go back to that information later. When in actuality, when we started to look, not everybody was doing that. There were some who had some dates out there that we found, but then also um, we started talking, why? Why do you have to go forever? When's the last budget cycle of that impacted? Could we at least cap it at like five years or 10 years? And then you can start having those kind of discussions. Um, and then allocate some time on the front end when you're developing for having stakeholder conversations around this piece. I can't stress it enough. This was the piece our stakeholders cared about all the way through. When we were developing it, when we were starting to get our buy-in in order to finalize it, and as we started and have been implementing our audits. This is the piece that they're always worried about. Now we're talking about stakeholders. Natural transition right into it. Um, the stakeholder feedback really is important. So it's gonna help address potential problems pretty quickly. I can tell you that when we were developing our audit and archive um, plan and we got into the archive schedule and I was doing some of that outreach, I had one group right away and said, oh no, uh-uh, absolutely not, you cannot do that. I would, prefer to, I would prefer to get that hard of an opinion up front and then have that discussion before I try to roll it out, right? So address those problems quickly. Um, and also just break down the silos, right? They're in a different group, they're doing different things, they don't have the same lens that we do. I'd prefer to start having those conversations before I roll it out and kind of, let's see where we can kind of build a bridge between the two sides. Possibility for identifying some process improvements. Building trust. Another area where you probably wouldn't think trust, but building trust, reduce the chance for somebody feeling left out. If I'm gonna roll it out and I didn't tell them at all, they're likely to get their nose bent out of joint or get their feelings hurt or just be upset in general. Might as well build some trust along the way. It takes a little bit more time, well worth it. Um, and then just a matter, a matter of trying to manage some of those expectations and discover what they care most about. Maybe you can take a piece that they care most about and pull it in and roll it in. Um, when I was doing all our stakeholder outreach, I kind of almost accidentally in a way managed to reach out to one of our folks in IT that oversees our intranet. We don't handle the intranet, it's our IT group. They became our biggest supporters and asked us to just roll them into it. So you never know, but it, that's where you uncover what matters to them. So I kind of hinted at some of the stakeholder piece, but when you're thinking about identifying your stakeholders, web authors, no brainer, right? They're in there, we know that they're already working on it. That's a great group to consider as a stakeholder in your discussions. 
key content um, contributors. They may not be your web authors, but they're driving a lot of that key content. So I gave some examples for us. It was you know news and media. Um, the consumer information group was a definitely a big key content uh, contributor. Um, points of contact for key kind of high profile stuff. A couple of examples from us. Budget is a big one. Uh, milestones. A lot of times these are the ones where it's very, very high profile area. Make sure you capture those folks. Um, leadership. Stands on its own. Um, and then I already told you, points of contact for related resources like the intranet. They can become some of your best advocates going forward on your guidance and help you to gain more momentum going forward. Um, in general, as you're thinking about it, these are, were some that we did, but as you're thinking about it, I just recommend soliciting input from anyone who has a strong interest in web content. So as you're collecting some feedback, here's some things that you should maybe think about or that I would recommend thinking about. Um, would the stakeholders prefer to review a draft copy? Or would they prefer to have a meeting to talk about it? Or maybe a hybrid approach. Maybe it's somebody who would like to have that draft and then maybe wants to sit down and meet afterwards. Think about who your, your person is. I, I can tell you that I have certain people that would prefer to have the document and look at it and share some comments and then meet. And I have other people who, they don't care, they just want you to have a meeting and walk through it. So I tried to kind of match their approach because I want to get their buy-in. Um, also, about, just kind of think about what, do they all have the same needs? Do some of them have different needs like I just mentioned? Um, and is there any order you should follow? And I think this one is an important one for us leadership was dead last because the primary concern leadership had, what did the other people, did, who did you share this with? What feedback have you gotten so far? So for her, it wasn't necessarily about the minutia of a specific content type. She wanted to know who else I'd talked to that was involved in web content and what the feedback was and had I addressed it. Um, and then I would just say it's really important to focus on the archive. Uh, the, oh, archive and archival. That's great. Audit and archival recommendations that directly impact those people. Um, if you're going in and you're going to meet with somebody and all they do, their only area that they're interested in is news and media, don't bother going over the whole thing with them. Highlight, this is specifically the piece I want to talk to you about, and this is why. We did have a couple of concerns pop up, so I figured I would share some tips for reducing some of those concerns. So um, for us, one of them was the difference between archive and delete. A lot of people really didn't know the difference between, and it's something that, that I think my world were like, oh, it's no brainer, right? Again, trying to peel back and realize that just because it's no brainer in my world doesn't mean it is in somebody else. Um, and then highlighting, once you just explain those differences between archive and delete, that archive content can be retrieved. Don't, don't freak out. If you ag agree and allow us to follow this guidance and to archive it like we're telling you to, we can retrieve it if we have to, if you have a concern or if you need to go back and see it. Again, that's where page freezer is also kind of a nice safety net if you have a tool like that. If you don't, just, again, stick with the whole archival, it's not all the way gone. We can retrieve it if we have to. Um, another piece was just sharing examples. There's other federal agencies that have it. There's other audit and archive policies that are out there. If there's a specific site that has a reference to something that is applicable, um, in this particular instance, I'm thinking back to when we had some stuff around the um, meetings and events, and I'm trying to compare to what others are doing with meetings and events. I was able to say, hey, Here's two or three examples of what I'm trying to tell you they're already doing it. So just some ideas. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I missed it. How, how are you defining archive? How are you doing the archiving? In Drupal. Okay. We have the ability to just archive within Drupal, and then it's retrievable afterwards. Okay. So you're keeping that content in Drupal, just unpublishing it, basically. Yep. And then we set up our redirect to whatever we're going to redirect to, depending on what it is. Um, they're, been some instances where we're like, eh, these two pages are really sim similar. Let's make sure this one primary page has all of the content, and then we'll archive the other one and just redirect it to the page that now has everything on it. 
In other instances, it might have been a page where it was just kind of obsolete because it had been out there for so long. And then, you know, you decide to go to like a landing page or some other page for it. Do you ever delete them? We, we don't tend to do that, no. We, we throw it into archives and it's, again, if somebody comes back, I would prefer to be, I'm, I'm dealing with scientists. They're very leery and very gun shy to do this anyway. I want to give them that peace of mind. I can retrieve it if we have to. Is there and, a retention policy though? Isn't there 20 years or something that some of the best to stay around as far as federal government is concerned? I don't think it's, I don't think it's tw 20 years. <laughs> I, yeah, there's something out there. I don't think it's 20 years, yeah. though. But no, we, yeah, we just don't like to either. We, we prefer to go ahead and um, archive it and just have it hidden and not delete it. I guess there potentially could be a, an instance where you would delete, but it would be a really rare instance for us. Content inventory. Don't forget about the content inventory. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to go too far down the archive tangent, but um, that, that question about unpublishing it versus, say, like putting an archive banner on it, because I also work with scientists who don't want to take stuff down, so we do the archive banner. Um, did you guys talk about that decision? And if so, like, what was the rationale behind fully taking it away from the public, but just keeping it for HL? Again, starting point, we're modeling after the HHS plan. So I started there, um, which helps a lot and I was very open and I shared that example every time I met with stakeholders. Um, secondarily, our, our goal is to make sure that we're not having outdated or redundant or old information out there and we're always trying to explain that. We have had instances where we get a little bit of pushback and we take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but no, we don't tend to like to do the, the banner unless it's very specific things. Um, maybe if it was like a news piece and it's got to be out there for historical piece of reference and it's so there's some pieces out there then might we might do something like that but when we can we would prefer to actually archive the page um, we it's a very much a it, it's a process of having that discussion and going back and forth and figuring out what we can do and what we can't do sometimes it's a matter of making a compromise and we're happy to continue to move the needle as long as we can move the needle we give a little in order to get a lot, which isn't a great answer, but it's truly our answer. Yeah. Um, do you ever have a problem with people outside your agency, like members of the public, who are upset because you're taking things down? No, okay. uh, I haven't had that. But honestly, for us, we have for the NIA main site, we've got the health communications channel. God, that group is amazing at how well they maintain and keep that content fresh and up to date. No, we we haven't. Yes? What's the process when you archive? Do you have to put a piece for record management, say someplace, or, you know, uh, and then archive it? Like, which, what are the steps to archive? I'm gonna get into archiving in a little bit more in just a minute, um, and then there's pieces of your question that aren't fully addressed in here, but um, no, we don't, for, for your reference, no, we don't put it somewhere else. We truly do archive it within Drupal right now. We're in the process of kind of looking at some other pieces on it. So when I get to that piece, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, great question. Content, web content inventory. Um, it's really a comprehensive list of all the content on your website. Um, and it's what you use to help guide that content audit, the actual implementation, right? The content inventory can help you when you really start building it out to identify content gaps, um, missing or maybe duplicative information. We realized we had like a timeline and a history and they were pretty com comparable, duplicative, right? Just over time, things happen. Um, user groups and potential new user groups. We've had some user groups that were out there for a while as we were starting to think about like our points of contact and how we were gonna break things out and we realized that it's gotten bloated and things had changed within the structure inside and we maybe needed to start subdividing and splitting some of those. Uh, another thing is opportunities to improve SEO, navigation, accessibility. Um, and then potential content anomalies. We started finding some URL discrepancies when we started diving into this. So you, it's it, interesting, I think, as you start to build them out, the things that you'll start to discover. 
Again, I'm huge on uh, my analogies and my comparative descriptions. So content inventory, I like to think of it as um, similar to the way you would create a solid foundation for a building, right? Your content inventory is creating that foundation for which you're gonna do and conduct and implement your audit process. This picture up at the side is actually my fiance walking on the foundation to our home when we built it years ago. Just for a little added humor and a little bit more about me. And again, borrowing from my fiance, this is actually his wall organization unit in the garage. He's hysterical. He's a international auditor by trade. He's an auditor with the Department of the Interior. Man, I don't know if any of you are familiar with auditors, but they are like everything has to have its place. And if it's not, he kind of loses his mind. <laughs> but really, it's important to organize your content inventory. So I felt like this was a kind of a good illustration because that content inventory is going to create that good organization that's going to help you to locate and retrieve the information you need in a timely fashion as you're going through your audit. <clears throat> so as you're thinking about organizing your data, a couple different resources that you might want to leverage or use. Analytics, sitemaps, Drupal URL list if you can pull one down from the back end of Drupal. And there are some automated tools that have an, obviously an additional expense. I'm not going to get into that piece because quite honestly that's not an area that I know a lot about. We had low budget so we leveraged the other items but I wanted to put it up there for those of you who may have an interest in exploring it. When you're manually curating, curating your content inventory like we did, you can really do it in two different ways. You can create your full list in advance or you can kind of create it as you go. If you're gonna create it in advance, um, it's, it can be extremely time consuming, especially the more content that you have, the more time it's gonna take on the front end, right, to build that out. But at the same time, then you're starting with that full picture right from the beginning. Yeah. It's possible to build some really slick views in Drupal to help to facilitate these wonderful people's work. You can see part of where I told you I had other ideas coming. <laughs> Krista works with us at NIA. Um, she's the wizard behind the screen that just magically makes these cool things happen when I have wish lists. Uh, create as you go, the second option. It can feel more manageable in the beginning, and I will tell you that this is the approach that we've taken, but sometimes you can uncover some blind spots as you go because you're not having that full picture, right? So just know. I don't think that it's, I wouldn't necessarily say go with one versus the other. Just giving you some things to think about from our experience from building out ours. Um, as we were building out ours, that's when we got into that situation where all of a sudden we were like, oh, we have this content group that we were going to do, but now we're realizing that the structure of the NIA has changed and evolved over time, and we have more than one group of, you know, narrowed down con point, points of contact for reviewers. We really need to kind of split that, and it's now one that was, is being split into three for us for our process. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, when you're doing your content inventory, there's a few things that you might want to think about, including. It's not a be all end all. It's definitely not something where you have to have everything here. But these are some of the things that we put into ours. You get the page title, you get the URL, the content type, the point of contact, the web author, if it's different than the point of contact, because sometimes they weren't the same for us, um, the date that it was last updated, whether or not we're proposing it for archive, kind of a yes no field. That was really helpful because there were some where we're like, we just worked with them not that long ago. No, we're not going to touch that one yet. Let's move along. Uh, proposed up by date. Oh, yes. I, I may have missed this, but is this the first time you're going through this? Have you gotten to iterate it? Oh, I'm just curious. Thank you. No, it's an excellent question. No, and I actually was going to touch on that a little bit later anyway. Yeah, we um, finished our plan at the end of last year. This is our first year implementing. Lots of lessons learned. I'll share a few here when we get in. Yes, we will be doing some iterating. That's in the works. That's, there's ideas brewing and some plans to start kind of iterating as we go, yeah. This prompted it because I was curious if this was, if you're planning on using the same 
site inventory the next time through and adding to it or if you have that planned out just yet? Not fully, we have some ideas and it's probably gonna be in some cases, depending on how we move forward, we may stick with this one for a little while, just balancing workload wise. But Krista did kind of hit on something that's been niggling in the back of my mind that I think there's a better way to pull some of this out of Drupal in the future, but then that's a matter of what we all face with websites, right? Managing priorities and what's our first priority versus the, something that may have to wait just a little bit for us to get to it. Great, great question now. Um, the update frequency. You definitely want to make sure and go back to what you set up on your archive schedule and make sure it matches if you're going to put it in there. And then these last two are really something that you might not think about, but I, I think they were really helpful for us. One is status, because it really helps us as we're continuing to work to remember that status, especially from in progress. We, we want to know where it is. And then the comments field. We don't have just one person who's working off this document. So to be able to share those comments as we're multiple people are in sharing the document and working towards this goal, those two pieces in particular have been really helpful for us. A uh, few lessons learned, because as I mentioned, we definitely have had some lessons learned as we go. Um, I recommend setting some targets. Getting yourself, as we're talking about these content you know, types and breaking it down, Establish some target dates. Um, we had a couple times where we didn't have our target dates in the beginning, and then we'd be rolling and rolling and rolling, and it kept taking longer and longer and longer. And we're like, oh, maybe we, we need to define something and see if we can at least get a target date out there to help rein that in a little bit, make it a little less daunting and a little more feel like there was steps and it was in control. Um, it's a collaborative effort. So you may have to pivot in order to accommodate scheduling conflicts. If you're trying to get a point of contact and you want them to review a set of like three or four pages and you've already been pinging them a few times and you're getting, hey, I'm going to this conference and now I'm going to that conference and then I'm gonna go on vacation. Just pivot, come back to them is my best advice because sometimes rather than continuing to chase that one, there's something else that you can start pivoting and going to with somebody else and come back to it and you'll be more efficient as you go. Um, milestones. This is another one that I think that we, I'd like us to do a little bit better about celebrating our little milestones, our wins as we go a little bit more. It's huge. It's ongoing. If you're going to be doing this, this is going to be an indefinite ongoing if you're really going to embrace it. I think it's really important to find those opportunities to celebrate your wins as you go. Um, adapt. <laughs> in, in my experience, challenges come up and I think that the, one of the harder things for us was to realize that these challenges were coming up and to be okay with it. So I would just tell you, please try to be okay with the, the challenges that arise and just embrace them for what they are. It's outside of your control. What can you do? You can pivot. You can move, shift to another content group. It's okay. Um, and then here's a piece, and I think this kind of gets a little bit back to your question, and it doesn't go as deep, so we can talk about if I don't hit it, but this is audit SOP. This is something that we are aware we need now. The, the archive guidance document and our archive schedule wasn't quite enough. We really have decided that we need a set of guardrails. We need a standardized checklist so that we are approaching each one of our audits with our various stakeholders in a very similar fashion. Right now we've been going to them and saying, hey, we're coming to you, our recommendation is to review in this cycle, our recommendation is if it hasn't been touched or hasn't whatever, here's our you know, archive recommendations. We looked at it and we think that you can you know, do some changes to improve users' your experience. And then all of a sudden we've found that we have certain projects where it just tailspins and it goes into these really lengthy discussions and they want a complete 100% overhaul, which is a little bit more than what we were intending at that time. We're happy to do it. But I highly recommend setting up kind of that checklist so that it's, you're, there's a little more standardization to how you're approaching each and every one of them. We left it so broad and so open that some of ours just ballooned into something much, much bigger than I think what we originally intended or thought we were going to get into. Um, does that cover a little bit of what you were asking or not really? Okay, ask your question again. Let me see if I can do a better job of answering it. No, you're, you're good. 
Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. This is actually right at the end of it, too. Key takeaways. Um, really, just like health checks, health checks uncover uh, potential problems before, before they become a big issue, web checks do, too. Um, leverage some existing guidance. It's going to make your life a lot easier if you can leverage it as a starting point. Uncovering and fixing issues now reduces potential um, for problems in the future. This is a great opportunity to also optimize SEO, digital accessibility and navigation. And it's really important to gain that stakeholder buy-in. You're going to have a more successful project. That's it, I promise. Oh. I guess that and my huge shout out to my coworker. Derek Rebuck is awesome. He's doing a huge amount of our work. So thank you for giving me a shout out. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.